I've been working up, I came to California in the 1980s, I got my PhD at Berkeley. And one of the first things that I did when I got to Berkeley um, was met this guy in wildlife. And he went, hey, we're gonna go on a trip. And so for my first trip, uh, being out here in California, we hiked the Arroyo Seco from the mouth to the source. And that was no easy, no easy trip. And um, that's the Arroyo Seco on the left. And that's where I met my first steelhead. Not that spot, but that's where I met my first steelhead. And I just went, holy shit. Um, I've, and ever since. Uh, while being at Berkeley, my major professor was Luna Leopold. And so I did a lot on river geomorphology. And so I spent a lot of time trying to connect the physical to the biological. And that's what I've been pursuing ever since. So I've been at HSU full time. I quit my own consulting company. Try that sometime. And uh, now a professor at, at H adjunct professor uh, at HSU. Um, so my work in Southern California, I'm not the expert. I'm looking at a sea. I know a number of folks, folks here that I'm kind of going, oh, man, I'm in trouble. Uh, but I did work with NIMS on looking at the San Ynez River. And of course, what does looking at mean? And what I was trying to figure out was how the San Ynez used to work. And so am I advocating you know, getting rid of all humanity and bringing it back? Maybe deep inside. I mean, everyone has that. But you know, no, of course not. Uh, but I think it's important to know how things, or at least guess, how things used to work uh, before we try to come up with a real strategy on how, how to fix it. So I'm trying not to be a Debbie Downer in this. Uh, but uh, we'll see. Uh, next slide. So I was asked to do a really quickie on the life history of steelhead. Does everyone know the life history of steelhead pretty well? Um, there on the left, uh, you can see, I can't, I, is, that, is that bad now? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Oh, I, you can watch me get tangled in this. Um, so we've got our adults going up, spawning, eggs incubating 40, 50 days later. We have the emergent fry over here. We've got the juvenile fish in the, in the headwaters and elsewhere. And then they may spend from uh, zero to three years in fresh water before heading out as smolts. Uh, we always have a little bit of a bias. We always call it, we say the estuary from the stream, but we always forget there was a main stem channel between the stream and the estuary, which is a huge part of how I think these streams used to really work. And we get to the estuary where they all get big and fat and head out to the ocean and steelhead can, geez, they can go out for two to four years. Uh, they're oftentimes captured off the coast of Japan with uh, gull feathers in their gut. So they stay near the surface. So when they do deep seining for doing uh, censusing for salmon, they don't catch many steelhead. They're, they're near the surface. So they're, they're quite the fish. Next. Next. So two main things I want to get across today. Number one is adult steelhead migration success. And for me, that's saturating the, the watershed with eggs, given constraints imposed by the prevailing water year. So your adults come up, and they try to put eggs in the upper watershed, the mid watershed, the low watershed, depending on what kind of year it is. Was it overlapping flood hydrograph so that they can work their way upstream, or is it a really dry year? What's important about that is that the spring may be a good year as far as wet or dry. And depending on which it is, some eggs have not a chance in hell of going anywhere, where others have a chance of surviving. So it's a risk strategy, a very subtle, very sophisticated, or as uh, Leonardo da Vinci said, simple is the ultimate sophistication uh, for the life history of the steelhead. And so success, it's not getting over a barrier. Success is this. We put in barriers, uh, we put in fish passage structures, we do release the flow to try and achieve this. We kind of lose sight of what we're really trying to do. Next, please. So that's how our fish look like in Northern California. Uh, I work with engineers a lot, and we're looking at fish passage and all that sort of stuff. 
Um, but adult steelhead, to get into the upper parts of the watershed, they don't just have one storm. They're not waiting in the ocean. They're not going. And then they got their one storm peak, and there they are in these upper tributaries. It just didn't happen that way. And steelhead ratcheted their way up on the, on the wintertime hydrograph. First storm, getting up into the main stem, or in case down here, getting past the lagoon. Uh, next storm or two, getting closer and closer to finally you get, next slide please, a really small stream. This is a coho in my, my, my backyard uh, in Fieldbrook outside of Keda. Look at the time scale, just a few days. That fish is to scale to that y-axis, and so is that hydrograph. That's the depth of the water over that time period, and these coho are successful spawning in that. You can't be wading down in the ocean or the main stem when one of these little storms happen. You've got to be there to get there to spawn and to get out. Or in the case of female, you go to the edge of the bank, you cram yourself under roots, and you slowly die, uh, taking care of that red. So we have to think about passage not in such a simplistic way, remembering that the steelhead are vastly smarter and more sophisticated than we are. Next, please. The other half is getting out. This almost sounds like Star Trek, be healthy, be many, and be large. Um, but that's the game. Spread the eggs out, depending on what kind of hydrograph you're going to get and which strategy is going to work the best towards producing be healthy, be many, and be large. Being small isn't good <laughs> uh, when we're talking about getting steelhead out. And so the next graph or, is what is the tyranny behind smolts. And that's the smolt to, a, uh, smolt to adult return curve. How many smolts does it take for a given size to produce an adult? There are many shapes to this curve, although surprisingly few curves, really, in existence. Um, I, I, like, I like this one, but there are others. And so you can see that when you get to about 160 millimeters, the games begin as far as you having a, any chance of coming back after hitting the ocean as an adult. Next slide, please. And there are some numbers for you. So out of 1,000 smolts, you can see that around 160 is where the games kind of really begin. So your watershed wants to be producing, having smolts leaving the ocean in that 160, 175 is a number that shows up a lot uh, on the smolts and success. And to give you an idea, when you see a table, you really don't appreciate that. So I thought the next slide would help. Okay, there's 156 millimeters. So let's go back to the other one so you can see where you are. So 156 millimeters is a dollar bill. Okay, so back. And so that curve predicts that six and a half adults per thousand smolts with that size. Okay, so it's a game of chance. And every advantage that you can have in a crew can make a difference. Okay, next. All right, so this is a real typical curve that we use a lot. What it says is that here's the median. So in 50% of the years from 1920 to 2014, the gauge at Gibraltar, this is on the San Ynez, uh, gives you a annual rainfall of about 26.7, something like that, the red, uh, inches per year. In Arcata, it's 45 inches. And in Fieldbrook, where I live, one ridge inland, it's 65 inches. So a few inches can make a lot of difference. Um, and so I'm going to look at just a few water years uh, early, before the dams on the San Ynez, to get an idea of what was the hydrograph like before the dams. Because that's what the steel had evolved to. And, and, I, and I would say that they were wildly successful down there. In fact, maybe more productive than the steelhead streams where I am maybe by an order of magnitude. But it was very, very elegant, which meant it could be disturbed. Okay, San Ynez River, June 15th, 1914. It's a wet year. In fact, that one decade had a number of, of wet years. There we are where Gibraltar Dam is, the 22 CFS, 
And it's Dottie because Gibraltar Dam wasn't there in, 24, in, in uh, 1914. San Lucas Bridge, 42. The watershed area doubled. You have Santa Cruz Creek coming in and other streams coming in. A short distance downstream, there's Solvang at 85, with just a small increase in drainage area. That'll be a hint. And then there's Lompoc at 80 CFS on June 15th. Next slide. July 15th. <laughs> August 15th. Next slide. September 15th. Yes, Lompoc was flowing at 33 CFS or greater that entire year. All right, let's look at another year. I'm not going to go too much down the pike on this. The next one, oh, and here's, here's where I pull those records. These, was taken, these were taken straight out of the USGS water supply papers, which you can do on your phone right now and get. I need a drink water. Oh, here's it. Okay. There's a lot more to the records than just looking up water supply papers, but nevertheless, this is a, a great start. Next one, below normal year. So this was a 86th percentile water year, which means that 86% of, no, sorry, 68%, 68% of the years had a rainfall equal to or greater than what occurred in this year. So below the median, kind of a dry-ish, uh, below normal, almost dry year, dry year. So I'm only going to do June, and I think I did um, August. So there we go. Look where we are, Gibraltar, San Luis Bridge, 11 CFS Lompoc. So in a fairly dry year, it was still flowing in Lompoc. Next slide. Oh, and I did one more. Uh, June 15th and above normal. This is about a 30% year. So 30% of the years had a rainfall greater than or equal to the annual rainfall in uh, 1912. And here it is in June, and there it is in August. Next slide. I wrote the answer there on the left corner. <laughs> What's the process going on? Groundwater. For all, the <laughs> for all the variability from year to year, and you all see it with the fires and everything else and the drought in the, in the mountains, the main stems on the larger rivers were amazingly predictable. The groundwater was the modulator. It dampened out the variability. When I came down from Northern California, I was going preaching um, well, the fish down here can only go from one good year to the next very infrequent good year. And between them, they somehow managed to survive. No. On lots of little tributaries, especially ones that go straight into the ocean, yeah. But if you got big enough that you had a significant aquifer, like the San Ynez have, it really was a modulator. And the steelhead could really key in on that. And I'll explain how. And so looking at the effect of scale, spatial scales, watersheds get bigger, they get bigger floodplains, bigger aquifers. And those bigger rivers kicked ass on supporting populations. And what did we go and destroy first? The groundwater tables. Uh, next slide. So what's all that gobbledygook? That's poetry to me. And that's the hydraulics of the channel bed. Next slide. That's what it looks like underwater. And so what am I getting at? Next slide. Food. And so when we think about connectivity in the watershed, of connecting from the ocean to the adults going up, and from the juveniles the next spring, or even that year, coming down. Uh, we always think about getting there and getting out. But what was the key was 
for the juvenile fish was to eat their way downstream. Let's go back to that curve, the next slide. Sorry, it's down. There's that curve again. A 10 millimeter increase can significantly increase your survivorship of coming back as an adult. And in the 40s, when they were doing fish rescue operations, uh, Leo Shapovalov, who I had a chance to talk to shortly before he died in 1992, uh, captured millions, millions of uh, emergent uh, steelhead. Did they all just perish for no reason at all? I don't think so. But they went out. They weren't going to go back upstream. But once you pass San Lucas Bridge, like you saw in those numbers, the recharge kicked in, like where Solvang is. And so fish getting down there would have had amazing productivity. Uh, so you could get big. Your chances still were very low individually, but there were millions of them. So the strategy of rearing high in the headwaters is certainly important. Spending your first summer in a, in a drying up pool, and then the next winter dodging floods, and going out the following spring, and maybe even trying it again to be a two plus. But we kind of discounted the, the idea of rapid growth rates and getting out within one year. And when I run through all the population models, it's the only way I can explain some of the observations of the population sizes that people talk about. And there are iffy numbers. There wasn't many studies done then. What I want to leave you with first, and I've got a few more slides, is this is connectivity. We can do lots of little projects in the headwaters, but if we don't solve the connectivity, the steelhead will be a memory. Or we'll be talking about uh, rainbow genes uh, up in the mountains. Um, upstream and downstream is the way it's conveyed. But these aren't just simple transportation corridors. It was far, far more important than just simply transport corridors. Spatial and temporal. So there's scale effects. Plus, you have to have the flow at the right time. And not every year was the right time. Yet fish, the steel added, all these different strategies of staying up here, coming down to this part of the watershed, then heading out, heading out, staying there two years, heading out. Lots of different tactics. And then physical and the biological, eating particularly. Next. So what, are they, what do folks are doing about all this? There's a great, I won't say a great thing in uh, controversy, but the idea between passage and migration. Um, can't emphasize it enough. You'll see lots of reports where we're going to release a three-day flow, and that'll be enough to bring the fish up to get the migration going. Bullshit. Steelhead worked their way up. They, they needed higher flows and something, something simply better than, next slide, I call this the beer can slide, for an adult steelhead. So if you take two 12-ounce beer cans and you stack them, they're 0 0.8 feet. And you'll see studies that go all the way down to, well, if we provide 0 0.5 feet, that will get passage, parentheses, migration, parentheses. You're, you're being sold a bill of goods. Picture a transect twice the size of this room and I put down my two beer cans. And then I go down even a little lower. OK, that's the flow that's going to bring back this species. Yeah. But somehow, we don't put the numbers into what it really looks like. And so the two beer can method. Um, on little streams, yeah, it's got some application. And I'm, I could go on. I could, I'm teaching a course this fall, so it'll be 16 weeks on just this slideshow. So there's lots and lots to cover. But anyway, I do, like, I do like the beer can one. Next. On my way down, where did I stop at? What? Royal Seiko. It's right, it's right to pull off there at Soledad. Went to Starbucks, had a coffee in the morning, and then zooped over and did the Roseco. Plus it has a gauge. So it was flowing, the Soledad gauge was flowing at 50 CFS today, or, or uh, last weekend when I got here. And in fact, you can see it was up pretty high not that long ago, because you can see the capillary zone, the dark areas where the water is still at, you know, the, the, 
the tur uh, pressure, the moist water is still at the surface, and a little bit of ponding. Uh, but when I see this, the next slide shows you what I see. So what do I see? I am not on, I'm not on a psychedelic drug here. <laughs> Especially after you know, coming back to Oroseco after all those years uh, where I'd been before. This is the depth of the stream, and I've got, I could do a, ooh, another whole, I will be, another whole lecture uh, course just on the Riffle Crest Thalweg and how to use that for estimating all sorts of things in streams. But roughly that's the Riffle depth. So 0 0.8, you can see there, uh, the hydrograph or the depthographs, they're not flows on that X, Y axis, they're feet, a typical Riffle, over time. The blue is a wet year, green, yellow, and then red is the, the wettest years. So you can see it's pretty organized. Dry sewer, sorry. Thank you. Um, so, when f did fish have a chance for migrating out and feeding on their way downstream on the Seco? Oh, yeah. I mean, smolts could be moving out in March. And depending on, on a good year, they can move out quite a bit later than that, and probably did. And so, this tells me a lot about how the system worked. Also, notice how it drops suddenly. That last little bit of flow just goes underwater, uh, underground, right away. Um, so I was grooving on that picture of the, of, uh, the Roy Seiko at 50 CFS. Uh, just with two miles downstream is the other USGS gauge on the Roy Seiko at release. And next slide. That's it. Just a couple miles, that's it. So this is sort of connectivity in the face. Um, and, it's, and it was dry. I, I should have got the record uh, how late or early into the fall, uh, into the spring it was dry. But what's happening here? The, the salinous groundwater is not healthy aquifer. And it does drop quickly. It, it, it's, a, it's a complex story. I'm, I've been at it for about a year. And I didn't want to go down that rabbit hole. Um, but I'm going all the way back to some of the Spanish documents and things like that as well. I mean, they don't call it the Arroyo Seco for nothing, right? Uh, so, but anyway, this is a good example of the connectivity. So, this is my last slide. Um, I was at a, at a uh, documentary it three years ago uh, on a new documentary on Luna Leopold. It was at an Arcata, in Arcata. And I went, well, I'm going to sit there and then stand up and go, that's a lie. I know that because his son told me so. And it turns out it was an incredibly good uh, mountain uh, green fire uh, documentary. And about halfway through it in the dark, there was Leopold describing health. And for years, I've been asked as a PhD, a doctor of sorts, right? Well, can you define the health of a river? In fact, one time in front of about 700 people in a conference in Seattle, I was asked that. And I came back with, uh, I cannot hear it, I cannot see it, I think I'll call it Tao. And they didn't go for that. Uh, but I didn't have a definition. But here it was. Leopold didn't say ecosystem, he called it the land organism. And what he said was that the capacity for self-renewal of the land organism is health. And so the takeaway message here is that the connectivity is the health here for these, these ecosystems, particularly for the larger watersheds that provided the bulk of the fish. And then the health of land as a whole rather than supply its constituents. Look at the bottom. Leopold, Aldo Leopold was asked to be the environmental guy and probably the, the, essentially the Secretary of Interior then. Um, for John Dewey, and they lost. But look at that platform and then think where we are today. So, thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, again, my name is Tom Hicks, and it's a, and a special treat to be here at Patagonia. 
with its uh, dedicated uh, legacy of environmental activism, protecting the environment. And I think it goes without saying that we're in unprecedented times in the threats that our environment faces at the federal level. And I know it's due to the leadership of uh, everybody at Patagonia that uh, you know, national monuments and such have advocacy and dollars behind that advocacy. So uh, much of what I'm going to talk about tonight is a, uh, a member of that environmental family, but it's more along the lines of what are called voluntary conservation transactions, which uh, you know, I, I can already see some eyes are glazing over like, I want to believe, but what is that? And uh, I think here in California, we're especially fortunate to have the strong legislative and other environmental laws, the Endangered Species Act, uh, the Porter Cologne, the original Clean Water Act. There are things that make California uh, an especially uh, unique place to practice anything in the environmental law sector compared to places like you know, North Dakota or you know, other places where there just isn't even much of a, a state impetus to do anything to really protect what might be called baseline conditions. So what I'm going to jump in tonight, and gonna, maybe this is a good uh, quick disclaimer, are there any water attorneys in the audience? Okay, I see one who I know isn't. <laughs> well, anyway, I, I just bring that up because I used to be a, a, an outward bound instructor, a whitewater rafting guide for about 10 years, uh, starting on the Rio Grande in northern New Mexico. And uh, you know, geology is a theme of what you talk about. And you always want to know who in the boat is smarter than you are. And of course, it's always good to defer. Uh, at least one time or another, I had like you know, PhDs from uh, New Mexico Tech you know, talking about geology all day and talking about the Rio Grande Rift Zone up near Taos and the Sangre de Cristos. And you get into a lot of geology pretty quickly. But uh, you know, especially coming on the heels of Bill Trush's uh, presentation where you know, we really are talking about a a very uh, rich interplay of what might just be called multidisciplinary topics. Hydrology, fisheries biology, uh, geomorphology, geology, you know, plate tectonics happen. Uh, for anyone who knows anything about geology, last week, I, I kid you not, I got to use the, this uh, phraseology in a sentence where subduction leads to erogeny. And the, like everyone was with me, like it was a really good conversation. <laughs> uh, but of course, for many in the audience who don't know much about uh, plate tectonics and subduction zones and mountain uplift, you might not know that those are like technical terms. And I didn't know much about that either. I wasn't a geologist, but you learn things along the way. Hopefully you guys learn a few things about water law tonight. Uh, next slide. So uh, whew. there's always a disclaimer involved as an attorney. We'll get these slides to you. We're not seeing anybody taking notes. but I'm going to move along somewhat quickly. I'm not here to overwhelm you with the proverbial sip from the fire hydrant, but with water law, groundwater, water management, water bond, voluntary transactions. Uh, most specifically, uh, in 2014, the people of California approved a water bond, uh, seven point something billion dollars. Over 200 million of that goes to the Wildlife Conservation Board for projects that enhance stream flow. And we're, next slide please. And, and part of where we're gonna go, uh, much along the lines of like the cat that walks in front of the dog, almost like begging the dog to take a bite. These voluntary water transactions have been reauthorized by the state of California, money for water for fish, and especially being in Patagonia and, and just the, the tensions that come with things like the public trust doctrine, uh, the, you know, the idea of wasteful and unreasonable uses of water. Uh, California has branched out on a historically new limb to use dollars to help get to the goal of in-stream flow. But when you look at the hydrograph, uh, I, I saw Bill's kaleidoscope looking hydrograph, the recession curve with all those groovy colors. You know, what I saw in there was a lot of different variability. You know, each one of those is a different year, a different water type. And here we are, we're trying to figure out a recovery strategies for steelhead in the middle of what is never an average year. You know, the last four years we've been on our, our backs with the drought. And then this winter, every stream was going off singing hallelujah. But what are we doing in advance of that water to come up with new strategies to conduct that water, 
away for a rainy or a not so rainy day and create drought resilient strategies that bring water into uh, some of these fragile systems on the south coast. Uh, I'm very fortunate I get to work for organizations and clients like Trout Unlimited on the western United States scale. I get to work with organizations like the Scott River Water Trust up in Siskiyou County and many others. Uh, but what they all have in common is that in many of these places you're looking at larger stream systems. And here you get down into the southern end of the Steelhead Range and you're really looking at, at lifelines that you can step across that are measured in like 0.3 CFS. So I'm going to start to pick up the pace here. Hopefully you guys have your safety belts on. Uh, I guess there's, I'll do some kind of signal. You know. You know, again, variability, it's built into the system. Please keep moving. And I didn't even get 2014, 2015, 2016 in here, but what, you know, I was up in the Modesto Irrigation District a few weeks ago, and they were talking about putting water back in the ground. I was like, wow, the difference between last year and this year is that this year there's 40 times as much water as there was in the last couple of years. Can't we figure out a way to harmonize those, those volumes in a way that actually gives us durability for our species without having to come at the expense of uh, you know, farms or fish. Uh, I think that paradigm often gets used in a scareful way. And I think there's often a lot more water at different times of the year that if we're putting our collective heads together, that we can go a lot farther to protect these species. Uh, we all know what that looks like. Please. You know, this is again, the, the governor can do all sorts of things in times of drought. You know, Keep moving, keep moving. You know, like protecting fish and wildlife, you know, the stepchild in the family. You know, we all know that jobs, economy, jobs, economy, jobs, economy. But when it comes down to it, the fish, when we talk about voluntary transactions for water and water flow, they don't have any dollars in their pockets. So we really are talking about somewhat of a, a human-made artificial construct and trying to figure out how to value the, the, the increment of each water that might be left in stream, whether it be a, a cubic foot per second, an acre foot, or, or any number of gallons. Please keep going. Keep going, please. All right, sorry. Whoa, water rates. Who's had any experience with the water attorney or water rates in general? Again, you know, we're going to get a little bit into concept, concepts like appropriative water rates, riparian water rates, groundwater rates. And, you know, Candace, you'll just have like a little, you know, your thumb is going to hurt in a minute. Go, but, you know, what we're really looking at is like, oh, water rates take place in watersheds. And again, water rates are constructs that have been conveniently made up on the fly. You know, I think a lot of what we all realize is we're inheriting a legacy of a lot of, you know, using geologic terms. Again, there's like a, a melange of different kind of rocks and things that have kind of glommed together. We've come up with water laws as we go along. Uh, riparian rates come from the you know, eastern United States. Appropriate of water rates, keep moving please. They come from our gold mining history where uh, land water was in the federal domain. You take water from the creeks miles through the countryside. Well, lots of text. Everybody's like, ah, didn't want to do any reading tonight. But you don't have to. Uh, you know, the main thing to know about appropriate of water rates, you have lingo like first in time, first in right. It creates a priority. I get all of mine before you get a drop. Use it or lose it. The right to use that water is perfected upon your putting that water to a reasonable and beneficial use. One of the ironies of our uh, environmental efforts in this category of water rights is it wasn't until 1991 that the state of California recognized that leaving water in stream for fish and wildlife was in fact a reasonable and beneficial use. Until then, if you wanted to, you could not leave water in stream for fish. So, you know, I see that hydro, the hydrograph that Bill had, and it's really important, as much as we love rivers and we love the water that's in them, a lot of that water is all spoken for by a factor of eight. The fact that, the fact that water is ever in a river is more of a function of convenience for those who have the right to divert, pump, or otherwise. So please keep moving. Keep moving. You know, after you know, decades of uh, plaster mining, hydraulic mining, this picture here on the upper, uh, right there, I mean, I don't know if anyone's been up to Nevada City in that area, but I mean, there's so much tailings and gravel and rock move that it just totally changed the shape of that canyon. But what it really did is just created an ecological catastrophe, the sort of which we didn't even have the perspective to appreciate back in the 1870s and 80s. 
Please keep moving. You know, then after, you know, by 1914, the State Water Board decided it's time to create a new category of water right licenses. Pre-14, pre-1914, post-14, you got to come to the State Water Board and get a license. You file for a permit, and these can be conditioned such that in this last round of drought years, if you have a post-14 right, the State Water Board says stop. If you have a pre-14 water right, they'll come to you second. And if you have a riparian water right, you pretty much have the best seat at the table. You share those shortages equally in times of drought, uh, but it gets a real, little bit squirmy to how to, California is the only Western state that has both appropriative rights and riparian rights. And their notions of how to share shortage and how to quantify it and monitor it, ongoing headache that keeps water attorneys busy, uh, but it also keeps uh, you know, neighbors on their toes, always looking over the fence. Please keep moving. Riparian rights, that brings us really a little bit closer to Southern California where a lot of the action is in the V of the canyon. A lot of the alluvium, the, the, the soils where you can grow things, they're often on parcels of land that are adjacent to the water stream. And so with that, uh, you get these different notions of part and parcel. Even if you have a riparian right and you don't use it every day or every year, you don't lose it for non-use. You can't store it for 30 days, and that's an important part that I'll get back to later as we get into the water bond, that if we're looking at, hey, at different times and different years, there's enough water on the annualized hydrograph. It just so happens that in July, August, September, it's a little bit dry for the fish. What if we capture winter storm water flows, hold on to them for more than 30 days, which again, there goes our riparian water right, but what if we were to change that into some kind of appropriate water right and repurpose it for fishery purposes? All right, let's keep scooching. Okay, you know, reasonable and beneficial use. It's just another way of saying, uh, if you have a right to it, you ca it can't be taken away, but the state is in a trend of saying, well, can your water right be used more reasonably, more beneficially? And the use of price is a way to incentivize people to maybe stop growing alfalfa and grow silicon wafers, for instance. Groundwater, we're going to start to click through some of this a little bit quicker because the intricacies of groundwater are their own three-hour session, let alone a whole semester class. So we'll move through until we get to a background about different types of rights. But we're going to get to a couple of slides that have images of groundwater pumping. Oh, there it is. Perfect. So uh, can everybody see the arrows? Our main takeaway here is this is part of what Bill was referring to, like, you know, the steelhead loves the groundwater that comes through these gravels. These, alluvium, so, these alluvial soils create a time delay. It rains in February or March, and then somewhere between, you know, June, July, August, you're getting this cold, again, low volume flow, but it's life-sustaining flow. Let's go to the next slide. You put in a well, some of that ground flow is getting interrupted, and it's not going to the surface, it's going up the pipe, and then again, and then by the time your well is doubling down, you're really creating a, a cone of depression that really is essentially disconnecting groundwater from surface flow. In 2014, uh, California passed the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Quick quiz, who's heard of it? All right, some people have heard of it. It is a, a revolutionary law in the sense that for the first time, ground and surface water will be integrated and managed cohesively. How we do that is to be determined by local groundwater management agencies, and how they do that is yet to be seen. Uh, where the rubber hits the road is when you get into things called uh, overdrafts, and you're trying to get back into sustainable yield. These notions require a lot of money for monitoring, a lot of data points, and who's in charge, and what's the jurisdiction of that agency, and how are they going to keep me from growing my 500 acres of grapes, my 40 acres of avocados, etc. It's those out-of-stream consumptive uses that are direct threats, if not competitors, to the same water that the very same steelhead that we're talking about need to survive. So we're going to, all right, quick slide here. That just shows that as groundwater goes down or surface water goes down in dry years, there's often a more of a reliance on pumping from groundwater aquifers, a race to the bottom ultimately leaves more of a disconnect between our surface flows. The volume of flow that might be available for surface might actually be going into subsurface aquifer recharge. Whew, a lot of, lot of, I'm gonna catch my breath. Okay, back on it. Uh, so anyway, keep moving, please. 
these are you know, some of the most, the last several years have been interesting in California law. If one thought of it like the law as this like old, dusty, cupboard, archival, there's a lot of turnover going on in, in the state of California. And you know, in a nutshell, I think it really means that the state agencies have more authority, they're a little bit more aggressive, they're bringing more of an enforcement edge than they ever have, making people who grow water legally with things or maybe illegally, you know, cannabis is something that's, whoa, you know, that used to be illegal, but now it's, what is it? It's kind of legal somewhere, but to whom? And what are they growing? Is it medical or is it recreational? And how does that affect my water rates? Those are interesting questions that a lot of people are still waiting to figure out. Let's keep moving, please. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Stop, take a quick look. Does everyone recognize any of these agencies? Yeah, more than we can tell and talk about right now, but just keep that in mind. Let's go to the other one. We've got state agencies. So whatever you saw on the first slide, like just like square it. If you're a landowner, it's a headache. Like getting like notices from any of these agencies or what do I have to do to be in compliance? It becomes a regulatory burden. And I can say that as somebody who represents landowners. I do a lot of public interest work, but I also see the paperwork that people are getting and they're not water lawyers. They hand it to their water lawyers and their water lawyers are being like, you've got a lot of stuff going on. How people can keep track of this is sometimes onerous, uh, especially when those agencies aren't communicating amongst themselves. Uh, keep moving. You know, small thing, 2009, uh, statements of diversion and use. It used to be that if you uh, filled out these forms, great. But if you didn't, there was no penalty. So if you think about that for a second, why would I ever fill them out if there's no penalty? 2009, three-year hiatus, start filling them out by 2013 or, there will be, or 2012, there will be fines. And what we're getting is a new backlog of data that the state water board is getting that is basically people self-admitting how much water they're using. You start adding that data up, what we're looking at is a kind of like thing of it as like a python or a boa constrictor that's taking what might be previously large data gaps and squeezing those white spots out of the system. We've got more granularity about people's private property, what they're doing above it, below it, around it than ever before. And sometimes, you know, depending on who's using what information, it gets slanted, it gets used, it gets kind of adjusted in ways that can be, you know, a hammer on the head depending on who you're talking to. Uh, and I bring this up from the perspective of how do we incentivize landowners to do the right thing? I'd say that in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, there are a lot more conservation-minded landowners who want to do the right thing, but sometimes it gets a little bit confusing as they try to run the gauntlet between all these agencies, all these regulations. And again, I'm not trying to give everybody or anybody who's a bad actor a get-out-of-jail-free card. There are people that do need to have regulatory, you know, quote-unquote, wax on the knuckles. But you know, there's more to it here than I think uh, is often given credit. Uh, in our divisive sort of rhetoric of the day, there's a lot more middle ground when it comes to the environment, uh, as long as we have the right language and communication tools to reach out to people in different constituencies. Keep moving, thank you. All right, water bond, keep moving. All right, keep moving, keep moving. Keep moving. And I'll make sure that this slide is available, these slides are available to everybody. I think it's a good resource if you're trying to just, whoa, what is going on with the water bond? Who's getting what money? But let's keep moving. You know, has anyone heard of the Wildlife Conservation Board? Yeah, a, sm a smallish organization compared to its Department of Fish and Wildlife, big brother or big cousin, big family member. Um, again, it's a point of uh, you know, pride for some that uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife's director, Chuck Bonham, is from Trout Unlimited. Somebody who is very, very um, familiar with the intricacies and the complexities of uh, fisheries management, watershed management, water rights, water quality, and how does it all fit together to create the outcome that protects and enhances these fish. Keep moving. Good, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. All right, let's stop right about here. So, oh, the, so the, I'm here to talk today about water transfers. You know, it's taking about 20 minutes to get to it. Uh, but it does really, I think, uh, reflect the complexity of, you don't just start talking about water transfers or water transactions in a, a vacuum. And when you look at the, the science, what we're really trying to do more than ever, given the limited resources that are available to acquire water rights that can then be repurposed for in-stream or other environmental flow benefits, is people want to know what are we getting for our money? And it's really difficult. 
it's really difficult to quantify. Uh, again, if I put water on 40 acres of avocados, you come up with a consumptive use ratio of you know, a couple acre feet per acre. And you can pretty quickly burrow into like how many gallons per season that orchard, the, that grove, you know, whatever it is, citrus or otherwise, you can come up with those numbers. But where it gets a little bit more difficult is, well, I have the right to that, and I want to stop it, or I want to you know, fraction it up and say I'll give up 50% and you know, keep growing on 20, but let some of that other water go in stream. And as soon as that water goes past a point of diversion or doesn't get taken up in a riparian well or otherwise, the question is, well, what did we get for our money? Where did that water go? And especially here on the south coast with the alluvial soils, I was just telling somebody today, one of the least sexy things to spend public money on is groundwater. You want to go out and you want to see the fish, and you want to see that your water is the water that's making the difference for that fish to live. But when like 80% of what you might be buying is below the surface, so that like about six to eight inches of above, you have to shovel down like three or four feet just to see what you bought, and it just, it's not sexy. So what we really are working on here in uh, Southern California is not just how to make that sexy, but how to make it compelling so that if you're trying to ask the public to support projects like this, you're actually asking people to put on their thinking caps because it's a multidisciplinary Rubik's Cube. You have to understand the geology, the timing of the hydrology, and you have to understand, like, well, why would people ever work together if they don't have to? If they have a right that says, back off, it's mine, I get all of mine before you get a drop of yours. Some people call that litigation. Other people call it an opportunity. Please keep moving. So, you know, water transactions, here's money for your water rate. But here's a water transfer. I don't want to buy your water rate. I just want to use it for public benefit. And so you can get into these tools called forbearance agreements. On the Scott River in Northern California, they enter seasonal, split season leases. I'll buy your second cut of grass, your hay, your pasture, your alfalfa, in exchange for your non-diversion of flow from July 15th to September 30th. Keep moving. Keep moving. Now again, water transfers, they conjure up all sorts of things. I know that uh, everyone here of the Owens Valley yeah, it's, oh, you know, like I've got a slide coming up. It'll, you know, got some pictures of Jack Nicholson and, and Chinatown. And it always just seems to conjure up like the worst of California water law, you know, which is, is for one, it's, it's you, know, you know, Byzantine, it's a labyrinth, and like only the, 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 the trepid or the intrepid should go there. But, you know, what I would want to encourage people to do is think, well, you know, there might be ways that the non-diversion of water over there could accomplish an in-stream flow benefit right here and at the same time achieve some kind of multi-beneficial use type purposes that could include water supply for a municipality or maybe some kind of water quality benefit. You know, the solution to pollution is dilution. You add more water and all those background uh, uh, pollutants, they get proportionately smaller. Temperature is one of the biggest water quality parameters that benefits from extra, extra in-stream flow. Let's keep moving, please. Okay, please keep moving. All right, legally transfer, right, finally, it's good to get more of those legal terminologies in there just so people know that I'm the lawyer. Hey, you know, legally transferable water, what is that? I, I divert 10 at my uh, point of diversion. I move it through a half mile earthen ditch. I have return losses, ret transmission losses of about 50%. And then I only apply about you know, 50% of that water at the point where I'm growing stuff but even then, there's some subsurface saturation and maybe the ET, uh, envir the evapotranspiration, the consumptive use, might only be three out of those 10. So if I'm talking about not diverting 10, I don't, get to I don't get to transfer 10. I only get to transfer three or some fraction of it because those other seven units either are groundwater or enter into the hydrologic system in a way that other users of water have a reliance on that other water. It's not just all mine. Each drop, each molecule of water often gets used as many as eight times as it passes through a watershed. You know, there's a lot of interdependence, you might say. Let's keep moving. So we're about to get into the water bond. What's really uh, exciting is the state of California said, you know, there's a different way to solve some of these longstanding resource issues. We're going to bring some money to it. And everyone thinks, oh, we'll just throw enough money at it. 
you take some of the solutions that we're talking about here on the south coast, they don't quite work as well if you scale them to the delta, you know, the delta of the Sacramento and the San Joaquin rivers. There is just, you know, quite frankly, not enough money in the world to buy our way out of that problem. People on the south coast might say there might not be enough money in the world to buy ourselves out of the Ventura problem or the Santa Clara problem or any of these other Santa uh, Inez problems. But what we're really looking at is what I, uh, my family is, uh, you know, some of them live in Denmark, and we often talk about what's called human scale. Uh, some of the problems you have down here, no matter how intractable and how long standing they might seem to be, from another perspective, they're solvable. They're neighbors. There might be five or ten landowners in a quadrant of a, a watershed that if they were to somehow get their heads together, each of them could come up with a fractional reduction in some portion of their use and help us get back to rehydrating these systems at a level that doesn't put anybody out of business, but actually it can make everybody feel good about the shared outcome. You'll give me a signal on time, right, Candace? Yeah. I'm overdue. All right. Oh, whoa, slow down. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I did have to slow, throw in a slide. Uh, this last week I had the good fortune of being up on the Smith River. Have anybody heard of that up in Northern California? An entire watershed that's protected under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. My understanding is it's the, the only entire watershed in the entire United States which has wild and scenic status for its, most all of its tributaries. These are, the, these are the clean, clear flows that almost seem mythological compared to other places. Uh, for many years, I was a, a guide, not just on the Rio Grande, you know, the Muddy River, but I went up to Utah and worked on rivers like the Colorado and the San Juan, desert rivers that are always brown. Like, I didn't even know rivers like this existed until I got here. And then you do a little bit more of the homework of understanding, like, well, what are the factors that make healthy, vibrant, robust systems? And it's a lot of what Bill was talking about. It's microinvertebrates. It's you know, just unimpeded hydrograph, unimpaired flow. The variability, the different seasons that just allow these systems to gain the resilience and the strength, you know, redwood forest, et cetera. But you know, that's just a snapshot of what we might be thinking we're trying to get to when we're talking about enhancing flow. Let's keep moving. So Water Code Section 1707 is a, a designated area within the state bond uh, it says, oh, we can spend money on Section 1707. It's the, the magic wand. You know, put some 1707 you know, hot sauce on there, and all of a sudden, like, that burrito is ready to be eaten. Uh, but what are we going for here? You know, the, the state wants permanent. They want 20 years. They don't want, like, a one-year 1707. And these are uh, administrative processes by which you're really opening up the water rate uh, if I don't divert a water rate, an appropriate water rate for five continuous years, it's forfeited. I've talked to some people who said, well, I had the water rate and I wanted to do the right thing for the fish. I stopped diverting. One thing about neighbors is they're not going to come over and tell you that it's been four and a half years since your last diversion. They get the benefit of your forfeiture. So they kind of get all quiet. And then it's, oh... Sorry about that. And they all move up a rung on the ladder. So there's some pretty cut through, cut through rules of the road. But what I think from an environmental perspective is 1707 is a pathway to play on that same water rights highway. It's easy to get run over. You can go at it with an Endangered Species Act or a Clean Water Act enforcement action. But you can say, well, how and where could we apply any increment of money that might actually have some tangible wet benefit that meaningfully enhances the flow for these species and increases the likelihood of their survival rates for you know, whether it be passage or migration or different times of their life cycle. You know, what do the fish need where and when? And without having to talk to those with water rights as in a kind of all or nothing language, you can get into a more precise, nuanced language of the time value of water. We need this much water in this part of the watershed at this time of the year, but we don't need all of it at all times of the year. So let's keep moving. 1707 allows you to add fish and wildlife. It also allows you to leave irrigation on your water right. Depending on the year, I might want some permissive flexibility to grow something or to maybe grow fish. Uh, again, one of my clients, Trout Unlimited in Montana, says, in Montana, we like to grow fish with our water. You think about that for a second. Those are some of the kind of 
questions some of the ways that we're trying to reframe this conversation so that if any portion of water can be left in stream, well, let's, let's have it. Let's, let's save that for the fish. The problem is without a section 1707, that water is a sort of like slop in the system and anyone can come along and stick their straw in the river and there's no legally enforceable mechanism that could allow you as the water right holder who added fish and wildlife to your water right. It's my water right. It's my real property and I chose fish as the use of that water and I'm saying, no, get your hands off my water. Now, by the time somebody has the monitoring and the ability to bring an enforcement action against somebody to say, hands off my water, will be a far cry from where we are today. You know, in California, one of our biggest problems is the lack of monitoring, the lack of gauges, the lack of data that allow us to know how incremental inputs to the system at least have some intended benefit within stream reach A to B or A to C. Some of the work that I do for Trout Unlimited uh, touches on the use of uh, how do you incentivize private stewardship and voluntary behavior that has a net environmental good? And uh, years ago, I started uh, on this project with a gentleman named Huey Johnson. I don't know if anybody's heard of Huey. Uh, he's the uh, co-founder of the Trust for Public Land, uh, one of uh, the Nature Conservancy's first employees west of the Mississippi. Uh, he was Governor Jerry Brown's Resources Agency Secretary back, back in the 80s or late 70s. Uh, you know, a real, uh, you know, a mentor in many ways. Uh, he certainly has never uh, wasted any breath on me in terms of he, he is a tough gentleman when it comes to like, how do you drive a bargain for the environment? But what Huey uh, revealed to me was this notion that, you know, if you paint, uh, you know, Republicans as this and Democrats as that, you're really missing the story. The story is that a lot of people, whether they're of one stripe or another, really care about rivers and water in particular. And if you can bring tools to them that makes it easier for them to do the right thing, that might be the first step towards a win-win. So if, if you click. So I'm really just working with some great people who work mostly within what we call the land trust community. Uh, I saw some colleagues in the room. I don't want to single them out. but. Has anyone heard of land trusts before? You know, land conservancies. You know, these are entities that you know, enter into you know, fair market valuation conservation transactions. They often use conservation easements as their preferred tool to not own the entire fee interest, but they acquire, or maybe the landowner, based on their generosity. I know in this area, you've got a whole range of demographics, you know, people who have know more money than is even imaginable versus you know people who don't have much at all. Uh, but what is interesting in California is no matter what your your demographic or your background, you're drawn to moving water on a hot day. You know if you've got kids, if you want to go fishing, you want to go inner tubing, whatever it is, it's it's just a natural magnet for our recreational places and times. And uh, you know working with uh, organizations like Trout Limited, uh, you know, other uh, attorneys, what we did is we put our heads together to figure out how can we uh, prevail upon the uh, Internal Revenue Service, AKA the IRS. You know, why would anybody go to the IRS and, and want to talk to them voluntarily before they grabbed you by the ear and said, come on in for an audit? But indeed we did. Uh, if you could click through, you know, go back one. So, you know, can you donate an appropriate of water rate in exchange for some kind of uh, deduction, a federal income tax deduction? The short answer is there was no answer that the government could provide, and so we filed a so-called IRS revenue ruling. And with that, we're you know, trying to broach the question. Uh, just, I, I found out this last week that uh, based on some work going on up in Montana with a mining right owner, like an owner of a, a mine, is donating a water right valued at over $800,000 to Trout Unlimited. Trout Unlimited will have to pass that interest on to the state of Montana, which is the only entity that can hold an in-stream water right. But we think of it as a very first donative transaction in the United States where the federal government is allowing the, the largesse of the, the federal purse to be opened to incentivize these private transactions. It's happening on a, a tributary of the Yellowstone River, just on the northern boundary of Yellowstone. So, or Yellowstone National Park. So, you know, that's a, a point of particular pride. Uh, just out of quirks, I, I hate to say this, but tonight my computer had a 
a little failure. So I wasn't able to get all the slides that I thought I was going to have available for you. So in my last few moments, I just wanted to just talk about some of the local project work that you know, I don't know if any of you have heard about any of the uh, projects in the region that have been funded by the Wildlife Conservation Board. Anyone? Yeah, a couple sheepish fingers going up here and there. I mean, I'll just mention three of them. Uh, one of them is up on the Thatcher School. Uh, they're up on, in Ojai, many of you may have heard of it. Uh, a project uh, to install rainwater catchment systems. Uh, I've got a colleague in the room, Regina Hirsch, if you could just raise your hand briefly. I don't know if any of you have met Regina, but she's here. She kind of did like this. Uh, but ultimately, uh, as an attorney, you know, I'm working with really uh, intelligent, uh, creative, inspired people who, as a team, are trying to figure out how can we come up with solutions that fix real problems. Uh, Thatcher is installing a rainwater catchment system, hundreds of thousands of gallons, close to a million gallons of water. And in exchange for that capture, they're going to offset their use from a pre-1914 water rate on Thatcher Creek tributary to uh, San Antonio tributary to Ventura. How far downstream does anybody think that inkling of water is going to really go? You're welcome to hazard a guess. To the ocean. To the ocean. 100 yards. <laughs> well, let's say on average, between the two of you, you've got the correct answer. <laughs> But these are the kind of on-the-ground projects that we are at here. And we're not just in the beginning of the 21st century anymore. It's a, we're about a, you know, 17 years in, and we're thinking, whoa, is this how far we've come? What year is it? But what we're really getting at is, yes, we're really looking at incremental pulses of water that might somehow leverage other incremental pulses of water to hit flow targets within certain reaches. Uh, has anyone ever heard of La Casa de Maria over in Montecito? I mean, has, have you been there? Yes. Twice. What's, what are your thoughts about that location? It's, it's a spiritual sanctuary in the back of Montecito, of all places. And what you have is just a real blend of, uh, you know, oak and, uh, oh, what do we have here? The San, what is the, uh, the San Isidro River. And in the last four years, I've been working on some of these projects thinking, why are we even here? We're just like kind of like kicking dust around. And then we're here this year, and just to hear that river just reminded me of like how important every increment of water from whatever source can be cobbled together is really as critical as ever. Uh, climate change variability has us looking at longer periods between rainstorms, but when those rains come, get out your, your buckets. How do we capture that water and tuck it away in times of when it's going to be dry? And so again, with work that uh, Regina and others are doing, it's coming up with blueprints that can quantify the rainwater capture. In other projects, it's looking at stormwater infiltration. How do you slow down the rate at which all the water cruises out to the Pacific and sink that water back down in the ground? And again, to come back to Bill's theme, it's the groundwater gravels that really are the key. It's a natural asset. It's not a reservoir that needs to be built from scratch. Getting that water into that ground at the right times of the year is possible. It just takes the right landowners, it takes the right team, and it takes some thinking, but it can be done. And uh, another project that is really fresh off the press, uh, many of, well, some of us, but maybe many more of you now will have heard of a, a Wildlife Conservation Board planning grant that's looking at both Ventura and Santa Barbara counties and saying, well, what is the potential for conserved water savings? Leaving aside the question as to how much minimum in-stream flow do the fish need, let's just say we had a need for 10 or 20, we'll leave that to the side. If we were to really go out into our communities and install rainwater, you know, I think of like the Thatcher School, if they're at 100% baseline of water use today, what conservation tools and methodologies can bring them closer to 50% tomorrow? And when we wring that towel and those drops come out, Section 1707 is the tool that ensures that those drops are not taken into the next diversion ditch or used to justify the next condominium development. It's a very fine line of environmental work here in California. It's very fragile. 
I'm proud to say Cal Trout is one of my clients up in Northern California. They're doing some very cutting edge work, working with ranchers within, you, know, you have these decrees that again, you talk about water law, like decrees are like the, the cul-de-sac of the archive of the dust. It's like, ah, uh, like you just don't, don't wanna go there, but indeed we do. We go everywhere we have to, to talk to people, to find ways to get them to the table, to say, you know what? We don't have to fight about this. I've looked at the needs for my family. I've looked at the needs, and when we're talking about ranching families, your family includes your 500 head of cattle. You know, it's like every one of them is a family member. People are not out to like just get rid of cattle because somebody else somewhere else is like, get rid of your cattle. You know, I talked to a rancher in Northern Santa Barbara County, and he was telling me about a decision that he had to make during the drought. And the decision from one day to the next was we're gonna have to like eliminate 300 cattle. They were in the slaughterhouse before, boom. And that's just because the water wasn't there on the land to sustain the land in a, you know, in a really balanced way. And so whoever these people are, whoever you are, you know, I would just ask you to think about within your environmental hearts, what does it mean to conserve water? Public trust doctrine, big tools. Joseph Sachs, the legal architect of the Mono Lake case, was at a, a conference a few years ago and he said, you know, my prediction is that in the... Uh, protection of the public trust and in the bringing of the, the resources to ensure that the public trust doctrine is met, I anticipate that we will use money to get there. Half the room just went, oh. and the reality is we're already there. We're already there. Smart money has been investing in water efficiency for about 15, 20 years, and those conservation savings have not been going to the fish. It's Wildlife Conservation Board, Department of Fish and Wildlife, other dollars that are now getting in that ring and competing to ensure that some of these conserved waters can be kept in stream in perpetuity. And in perpetuity doesn't mean what it used to before we thought about climate change. But the point is if you connect the water rights and the entitlements to divert with the geographic map, we can all work together to really accomplish some, I think, incredible project work here in Southern California. So thank you all, and I'll be available afterward. So I know, um, I know a lot of you probably have uh, experience with fish passage, maybe more experience than you wanted to have with fish passage. Um, but I'm going to try to give an overview, uh, sort of from the design, fish passage design perspective, uh, hopefully uh, to help people who maybe don't have a lot of uh, experience with fish passage design. First one, Candace. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about what passage is, uh, show some examples of typical problems, uh, different types of physical passage improvements, uh, and how uh, we use hydrologic and hydraulic design criteria to design fish passage projects and uh, show you some, some recent examples. Uh, so uh, fish passage, uh, generally when um, we hear about fish passage, uh, it's because there's some impediment or obstruction in the, in the river. And usually it's uh, an, an obstruction created by people. So definitely when people call me about fish passage, it's usually about an uh, uh, obstruction that's been placed in the river. And so when we talk about fish passage, we're usually talking about restoring movement up and down stream under a range of hydrologic conditions. <clears throat> and hopefully, or ideally, we restore that movement under a range of conditions that's similar to the natural conditions that fish moved in. And it's obvious, I guess, but, but passage uh, or migration uh, in, in the broader sense, as, as Bill pointed out, is a life cycle requirement for an anadromous fish. If we don't have passage or migration, we don't have a life cycle, and we don't have an anadromous population. Uh, but it's important to uh, other uh, fish species, other than steelhead, we're, we're concerned about steelhead here, but it's important to other fish species, so sh we shouldn't uh, forget about those and to other non-fish species. So sometimes we talk about aquatic organism passage as a, as a broader passage term to fish passage. 
Uh, and, and passage uh, depends on different hydrologic conditions uh, that are hydrologic or hydraulic conditions that are relevant depending on the species and the life stage that we're concerned about. So we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. <coughs> so some of the typical problems. Um, this is a, a set of road crossing slides, the, the ubiquitous Arizona crossing in the, in the upper left and upper right. These are uh, roads that are built across the stream and sometimes the stream responds by changing its profile and then we're left with a drop that fish can't pass. Uh, lower left, um, culvert crossings at roads are often um, <coughs> too steep and too shallow for, for fish to pass, um, especially during low flows. And the picture here kind of doesn't do that culvert uh, justice. I think it's about 10 or 12 feet high, so a, a big culvert. And then sometimes uh, really odd combinations of things. Um, on the right-hand side, a couple of driveways uh, across the stream, a bridge overhead, so that are, there were three crossings, but I guess that wasn't enough, uh, enough so the two driveways got connected to, to pave the stream. <coughs> um, in response to changes in land use, urbanization, uh, changes in vegetation, agriculture, a lot of our streams have incised over time. <clears throat> and engineers responded to that by building grade control structures uh, to prevent the downcutting of the stream profile because that incision usually threatens infrastructure like pipelines or, or bridges. And so a lot of these grade control structures are out there in the watersheds and they become barriers to passage. Next one. <clears throat> Uh, flood control facilities in the 50s and 60s in Southern California. Um, civil engineers like me uh, came up with this great idea that we could use a lot less space um, for channels if we, if we put them in concrete. And um, so concrete channels, especially concrete supercritical channels, were built um, in much of Southern California. And they're very efficient. You can get five or 10 times as much discharge through the same width of concrete channel as you can through a, a natural channel. Um, but these concrete channels run at velocities of, um, that you might drive your car at, at 30 or 40 feet per second. So they're very difficult for fish to pass. Uh, and just a second, go back for a second, Candace, please. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> and because these supercritical channels are sort of sensitive to uh, sediment and debris, and we have a lot of um, sediment and debris production in the mountains of Southern California. An associated feature is debris basins uh, that go with the concrete channels to prevent sediment and debris from getting in the concrete channels. And those, that's the picture on the lower left, and those are also um, often impediments to passage. Uh, and then uh, various forms of of dams, so one on the <clears throat> right here is probably only two or three feet tall. Uh, very small dams that, that might have been built for residential diversions uh, to medium-sized dams, and then of course um, large dams that might block entire portions of, of watersheds. Uh, so when we talk about passage improvement, uh, there are many different uh, factors in improving passage or migration in a watershed. And uh, Bill talked about the, the hydrologic side, um, which is probably the first and foremost thing to think about in, in restoring passage on a, on a broad scale in a, in a watershed. Um, but what I'm mostly going to talk about are physical modifications for uh, passage where fish can swim or, or float by. Uh, structure, so we call that volitional passage, um, and a couple of different types. The simplest type might be to restore or modify a stream po profile that's been modified by a structure, by hydrologic changes over time, um, and then uh, more complicated situations require passage structures, and so I'll talk about different types of those. 
Uh, habitat enhancement is also a really uh, important factor in passage, uh, providing cover or food or better water quality. Uh, that's all part of the, the overall picture for migration in the watershed. <clears throat> and then there are things, uh, lots of hazards out there for fish, uh, poaching, predation, entrapment in places that they shouldn't be. So that's also part of <clears throat> the general migration picture, uh, but we, I won't talk about that much uh, tonight. And then there's a category that I called fish transport here, uh, things like trap and haul, putting fish in elevators, shooting them through cannons. Uh, this is non-volitional non fish passage. We won't touch on that tonight. <clears throat> Next one, please. Uh, so the, the barriers and uh, remediation of barriers, uh, uh, types of barriers, um, some types of barriers m might um, just be removed. And <clears throat> that largely depends on the function that they're uh, serving. So if, if a barrier can be removed or replaced by another structure that does the same job, uh, it's a simple case of, of removing the structure, restoring the stream to its natural profile. And that's the simplest and most sustainable solution in the long run to, to uh, barriers. Uh, other structure, other uh, situations require some type of structure uh, for <clears throat> either in-stream passage, a structure that's constructed in the stream itself, or a bypass structure that goes around the obstruction or the impediment. Um, and the, the little uh, diagram on the right is from the uh, <coughs> California Fish and Wildlife uh, Manual on Stream Habitat Restoration. It just shows some different categories of uh, full width restoration of passage, partial width restoration of passage or bypass around the, around the impediment. Uh, and the photos on the left, uh, this was uh, an at-grade crossing replaced, replaced by a bridge. So it's an example of, of restoring passage in the full stream width by restoring the profile. Center photo, an in-stream structure, a pool and shoot fishway at an agricultural division, di diversion. So that uh, is an in-stream partial width structure. The uh, photo on the right is kind of hard to see probably, but this is a bypass fishway that was actually constructed around a natural barrier in the 1940s by the Works, Works Project Administration. Next one, please. Uh, and engineers have come up with all sorts of different uh, ways to provide passage at, at structures. Um, so uh, a pool and shoot example at a municipal diversion on the upper left, followed by a, a step pool, reconstruction of the stream profile, uh, another pool and shoot on the upper right at an agricultural diversion. Uh, the lower left is a, a bypass fishway. Uh, this is a, a vertical slot uh, fishway around an agricultural diversion. Really complicated um, hydraulic design for a, a bypass fishway. Uh, center bottom is a modification of a concrete flood control channel for fish passage. And all of those photos are, are mostly intended as improvements for upstream migration. Um, <clears throat> but we also have to think about downstream migration and the photo on the lower left is a, is a typical improvement for, for downstream migration uh, that, where we have intakes for water diversions. Um, typically they're screened to exclude fish from the intakes and then the fisher bypass back to the stream. Next one, Candace. Some I talk a little bit about the <clears throat> design process for fish passage um, and, and design criteria. And <clears throat> the geomorphic assessment is really not, um, really not a design criteria, criterion, but <clears throat> it's part of the, the guidance in the California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, Habitat Restoration Manual on Fish Passage. And it's an important step because a lot of times the passage problem is not only related to the structure that was constructed, but it's related to the response of the stream to the, to the structure that was constructed. Um, and so when we have a 
road crossing or a grade control structure, a lot of times there's a, a stream response that makes the drop or the uh, passage impediment worse uh, than the original structure construction. And so the geomorphic assessment uh, is intended to not just address existing conditions, but to understand better how we came to the existing conditions and, and to project into the future what things are going to be like. <clears throat> if um, and an example of, simply example of uh, why that's important, uh, if you design a fish passage structure for existing conditions, the stream continues to degrade or in size, um, 10 years in, in the future, you might have a fish passage structure that's just in air that, that fish can't get to. So it's important to understand the, the trends of the stream and that's what the, the geomorphic assessment does. <clears throat> For road crossings in particular, oh, I, I need that one back. <clears throat> uh, for road crossings in particular, there are a couple of design paths, you might say. Um, and one of the paths is called stream simulation. And, and it's mostly applicable to places where there's, there's not a huge modification in the, in the profile. But the idea is to remove the barrier, um, reproduce the stream conditions that exist upstream and downstream. And uh, so after the barrier is removed, you have the same stream conditions, the same hydraulics at a given flow that you have upstream and downstream. <clears throat> and in that case, we don't do a lot of um, hydrologic work or hydraulic design. We mostly focus on the morphology of the stream, the dimensions of the stream, including the slope and the roughness of the stream, because roughness is a really important part of the hydraulics for Southern California streams. And so it's also a really important part of, of fish passage hydraulics. <clears throat> Where stream simulation is not possible, uh, we take a what's called the hydraulic design approach, which means we develop hydrologic criteria for what flows we're, we're trying to pass fish through uh, a location. And then we use those hydro hydrologic criteria to develop hydraulics through that range of flows to be sure that we produce conditions that fish can, can pass. Um, and the main reference is here, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, their California Salmon and Stream Restoration Manual, uh, NOAA's um, Anadromous Salmon and Passage Facility Design, and both uh, CDFW and NOAA um, also have uh, guidance on road crossings in, in particular. <clears throat> Next one, Candice. So in developing hydrologic criteria, the, the guidance from CDFW and NOAA, both are based on either on something called a flow duration curve or a flow frequency curve. Um, <clears throat> and this is an example of, of a flow duration curve. And basically the flow duration curve typically uses mean daily flows. And this is a plot of the percent of time that a particular flow is exceeded. And the guidance in uh, NOAA and CDFW established ranges for the, the percentage of time that uh, fish should be able to pass a particular location. So this is an example of um, the Paul Creek flow duration curve in, in Fillmore with the 1% exceedance flow on the left-hand side is uh, marked as 59 CFS and the 50% exceedance flow um, marked as 1 CFS. And so this is um, a typical range from the flow duration curve to establish the flows at which fish passage would be restored. And the curves, there's actually three curves here. The bottom curve is uh, a plot using the entire record. So it's, uh, sometimes people refer to it as an annual curve. The top two curves are, <clears throat> are curves for the uh, migration season or the, the season in which steelhead might try to pass this structure. Different, different uh, criteria for adults and juveniles. The adults criteria are, is marked here. Next one, Candice. 
Um, a lot of times we don't have flow duration or uh, a long gauge record to, to develop a long gauge record of mean daily flows from which to develop a flow duration curve. So alternative uh, design criteria are usually based on flow frequencies. Uh, flow frequencies come from an annual series of flows, the, the peak flow in each year instead of the mean daily flows. And uh, so there's a different set of criteria um, that are based on the flow frequencies, usually 50% of the two-year flow for, for adults for the high fish passage design flow and 10% for juveniles. Um, so both of those methods uh, are applied um, frequently, the, the flow duration and the flow frequency uh, methods, but there are some limitations on the use of, um, or some drawbacks on the, on the use of, of these types of statistical analysis for establishing the fish passage window, especially on streams, on small streams in Southern California where we have very uh, flashy systems, flows change rapidly. And one of the, one of the difficulties is that the, the mean daily flows, uh, a lot can happen in a day on a Southern California stream. So uh, if you have a mean daily flow of say 100 CFS, what may actually have happened is the flow might have gone from five to 300 CFS in that day. And, and that, that flow is only gonna be represented in the curve by that one point at 100 CFS. So you don't really get a picture of how flows vary. <clears throat> and you don't really get a picture from the flow duration curve of the pattern of the flows. Uh, it's just the, the total record um, kind of put together statistically. And so you don't see the patterns that, as, as Bill was pointing out, uh, are important to steelhead or any fish for, for movement in steps of our watershed. So that's lost in, in the flow duration or the flow frequency approach. And uh, of course the flow duration curve or the flow frequency curve itself does not really consider the connectivity from one place to another. It's just at the location that you're looking at. And it's not really um, directly related to any sort of ecological needs um, in the context of the watershed. <clears throat> so another way to look at um, passage hydrologic criteria is to consider passage opportunity or delay at a, at a particular location. Um, and uh, Margaret Lang and Mike Love did an interesting study on this a couple of years ago. Um, and basically the idea is to use the, the real flow record, the whole flow record, to look at the opportunity that fish have to pass a particular location, the times when they might not pass if you select a certain design criterion and the times that they can. So there's a, a passage window depending on the criteria you select and a, and a passage delay. <clears throat> and so this is an example of um, taking the um, full hydrograph on a 15 minute interval uh, at Pole Creek and looking at the effect of establishing different high fish passage design flow, flow criteria. Uh, and so on the <clears throat> graph, you can, uh, we, we did this for um, a, water years that were normal, below normal, normal, above normal, and substantially above normal to get a, a look at different types of water years. The graph shows the actual stream hydrographs and you can get an idea of the spikiness of, um, of this watershed and it's very, it's similar to a lot of other small watersheds in Southern California. <clears throat> and then the um, different high fish passage flows were, different high fish passage flow criteria were used to look at the incremental benefit of, <clears throat> of different of increasing the criteria from the, um, the flow duration guidance provided in NOAA and CDFW on 5%, 1%, this might be five and this one, uh, up to 50% of the two year 
um, and then going beyond that to 1% of the February flow. And in this case, what we found is that <coughs> increasing that high fish passage flow uh, design criterion gave us more, gave us significantly more passage days, more passage opportunity, up to about 120 CFS, and beyond that, the incremental benefit was, was reduced. And so this type of analysis was used to pick that 120 CFS as the high fish passage flow for this location. <clears throat> After the hydrologic criteria are established for um, a fish passage location, uh, we use that flow range to develop hydraulics in the proposed fish passage facility. And basically what we're doing is matching the hydraulic conditions in the fish passage facility to the swimming ability of, of fish. And the most basic criteria are the depth, the velocity, and the drop height, and if, there, if the fishway involves uh, drops or chumps. <clears throat> and the velocity criteria may change depending on the distance that the fish need to pass. So a fish can pass um, a higher velocity through a shorter distance because of uh, high burst swimming speeds. And the longer the distance gets, the lower the velocity criterion. And the criterion are based on uh, fish weight type um, and the life stage of the, of the fish, uh, the, the species of, of, of the fish, if there's more than one species. <clears throat> In addition to those basic criteria, there are additional criteria for things like pool conditions, pool volume, turbulence or energy dissipation, the entrance and exit hydraulic conditions, and especially the attraction to the fishway, if it's a, a bypass fishway. Um, so these are just two examples of hydraulic, two-dimensional hydraulic modeling, uh, using the fish passage design flows to look at depths and velocities in a fishway. <clears throat> and then once we have the hydraulics from, from hydraulic model, or from hydraulic calculations, we can use those to look at uh, the ability of uh, fish to pass at the uh, design criteria, at the hydrologic design criteria. So <clears throat> this is a graph developed from hydraulic calculations that shows the depth and the velocity at different discharges. And the uh, the purple curve here is the velocity curve, the green curve is the, is the depth, and the green and, and uh, purple horizontal lines are the velocity and depth criteria, hydraulic criteria, established for juveniles and adults in this particular project. And uh, so the... The markers here are um, for the juvenile and adult low flow condition, about, uh, I think this is one CFS, and the juvenile high discharge condition. So this is the flow range that, that uh, juveniles should be able to pass at. And this is actually a graph developed for an existing condition. Um, and so an existing channel, not, not a fishway. Uh, but you can see that uh, when we hit the juvenile depth criteria, so that's where that green line intersects the horizontal line, about the time we hit that, that line, which is enough depth for juveniles to pass, we also exceed the velocity criterion for juveniles. Uh, so basically there's no passage opportunity uh, for juveniles indicated here. <clears throat> when we hit the uh, minimum depth for adults, that's up there at about 55 CFS and one foot. Uh, we don't hit that until about 55 CFS in this graph. So that means that window of flows is, uh, there's no opportunity or there's a reduced opportunity for passage uh, for adults. And then once we're above that point, uh, we have enough depth and the velocities are, are below the adult uh, velocity criterion. So we have passage above 55. 
an excellent canvas. Um, so I'm just going to show some examples of, of uh, typical types of fish passage improvement projects. And <coughs> this is a burial, barrier removal project, uh, two low water crossings in Leo Carrillo State Park on the Malibu coast. So these are both road crossings of Arroyo Sequit. Uh, they had both probably been built close to the grade of the stream and, and had developed drops on their downstream side uh, after they were constructed. Next one. Um, <clears throat> so the geomorphic assessment in this case uh, showed that the stream profile had actually only locally been affected. There was a hump, a drop at the, at the road crossing. Uh, but in but the road crossing itself was sort of a local irregularity in the profile that indicated that these structures could be removed and the stream profile restored without an additional structure being built and a bridge was built at both locations that spans the entire channel so that provides streamwide passage and restores the stream profile um, and this is, uh, this is not, it's in Malibu, of course, so it's, it's not in the Santa Clara watershed, but it's actually pretty similar to a project that we're, that we're working on right now at Sea Star Creek that's in, in the Santa Clara watershed, which is the, the road crossing on the lower right here. Next one. <clears throat> a great control structure. Uh, this is on Arroyo Trabuco in San Juan Capistrano. Uh, <clears throat> and this is an example of uh, the location where the geomorphic assessment showed that the stream since about 1960 had degraded about 12 meters here. Uh, combination of a change in sediment supply from upstream. Sediment supply was blocked on one of the branches that leads to this, um, this location. Uh, an increase in urbanization that, that um, also probably reduced sediment supply and, and uh, increased flows and uh, this, the response of the stream was to drop about 30 or 35 feet. And um, in this case, um, some form of this grade control or this structure needs to stay there. That, that's a, a uh, Metrolink rail bridge that's sitting on top of the, the grade control structure and there are two uh, big water pipelines buried in the structure. So <clears throat> this drop had to, had to stay in place, which meant uh, we, had, we need a structure to, to replace it and to provide passage. Next one. <clears throat> uh, so both uh, in-stream and bypass type fishways were considered at this, at this location. The bypass fishway, or sort of a hybrid bypass fishway, was, was selected for the design. Um, and the hydrologic criteria were established from the flow record uh, to give us that range of, of flows for high, from high to low fish passage. Uh, and then the hydraulics were uh, analyzed using uh, one-dimensional models, hydraulic calculations, and two-dimensional models. And ultimately, because hydraulics in this case were pretty complicated, um, Two physical, physical models were built, uh, one at one to six scale for the fishway itself. Uh, so one foot in the, the model equals about six feet in, in real life. <coughs> and a one to 20 scale model of the, of the entire structure with the, the um, revised drop structure to pass the, uh, to pass the 100 year flood. <coughs> so those are two photos from our lab in Seattle of the, of the models constructed to look at this fishway. Next one. <clears throat> the Pole Creek Channel in Fillmore. So this is about uh, two miles of, of a tributary to the Santa Clara River. Uh, there were four reaches in that two miles, each with really different characteristics. Uh, it's a site that's really constrained by adjacent residential development, uh, the supercritical flood control channel that, that needs to provide that flood capacity, uh, and an EPA Superfund site, cleanup site, 
on the east side of the channel. <coughs> Next one. So um, again, the, the hydrologic analysis was, was done and hydraulic analysis was um, made for the existing conditions. A graph that we were looking at earlier was actually one of the reaches in Pole Creek under existing conditions. Um, and, and that work determined that all four reaches had significant passage problems. Uh, and there was a collabor collaborative process uh, with the city, the Watershed Protection District, fisheries agencies, uh, the residential developer, the manager of the EPA Superfund cleanup site, uh, collaborative process to develop alternatives. And then th those alternatives were, were analyzed hydraulically um, and they range from an in-channel fishway, a, a fishway in the concrete channel uh, to full removal and replacement of that concrete channel with a, with a natural channel. <clears throat> and out of the alternatives analysis, a, a bypass type fishway, a nature-like bypass fishway was selected as the preferred alternative uh, for the two reaches that had the concrete channel and the debris basin located in them. <clears throat> okay, next one. Uh, so this is the Vern Freeman diversion on the Santa Clara River. I think you probably all know that it's been an extended effort uh, to improve fish passage at, at this facility um, and a hardened ramp design developed by AECOM and, and R2 is in the, the um, United Habitat Conservation Plan. <clears throat> and uh, we just recently started working on the fish passage topics at, at this structure. Uh, and what we're doing is uh, investigating the, some alternatives that had been developed in the, in previously to look at uh, notching the dam or an infiltration gallery at the dam to, to reduce the effects of the, of the dam on <coughs> high flows. And the notch um, adds a big level of complexity um, related to the potential adjustment of the river after um, the dam notch is constructed. And so we've been doing uh, both long-term and event sediment transport analysis uh, to look at the potential changes in profile of the river. So the graph shows uh, the existing profile uh, with the drop at the diversion location and uh, the colored lines might be a little hard to see, but they're the progression over time of the river profile with the, the notch in place, uh, showing the profile of the river changing over time to be more similar to the, the profile that existed before the, the diversion was constructed. And it takes about 30 years to go from um, the existing profile to that, to that ultimate profile. Next one. Um, so because it takes a while, uh, the, the, the aggradation of the channel is uh, <clears throat> potentially a good thing for, for uh, fish passage because it reduces the drop height at the dam. If we can aggrade the, the river channel below the diversion, that means there's less drop for fish to pass. And, uh, but in the interim, as the, during that uh, 30 years, potentially, or at least the first decade or so, as the river profile adjusts, uh, there will still be a drop <coughs> downstream of the, of the notch. And so the, um, the area downstream has a, uh, in this concept, has a, a rock ramp to allow for fish passage in that interim period uh, and the notch is down at high flows and it's up at lower flows to allow for a diversion into the into United's intake and so a bypass fishway is uh, is needed for uh, those low flows while the diversion is being made and uh, we did an initial phase of this of this work uh, to look at the the feasibility of the notch concept um, it, it, has at least some promise, and so we're, we're now working on a second phase uh, that includes 
more work on river behavior and sediment transport, uh, the hydraulic analysis for the rock ramp and the, and the bypass fishway, uh, and, and looking at the hydraulics needed for operation of the diversion. Next one. That's it. Thank <laughs> you.